You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live every Friday at 1.30 p.m. Central, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by Quick Strike Options Pricing and Analysis Software. Quick Strike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy-to-use web-based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page-level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. Quick Strike has you covered with market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility. Quick Strike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about Quick Strike at Bantix.com. That's B A N T I X.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Quick Strike One. That's Q-U-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E-1. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means it's time once again to wrap up our week with Twifo. Yes, it's time for this week in Futures Options. If you can't figure out what the show's about, it's right there in the title. We talk about the week that was and indeed still is in the Futures Options side of the realm. So commodities, some indices, maybe some other crazy write-ins you guys sent us this week. We break them down. The hot action, the big strikes, what was actually trading out there, what's going on from a volatility perspective, both implied and, of course, our favorite, the old quick skew, what's going on in the calls and the put wings independently or together whatever your preference may be across the broad spectrum of products trading over there at CME Group. My name is Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting Options Insider Radio Network. If you're listening to us after the fact on the podcast, as I know many of you guys are, first off, welcome. Secondly, make sure, if you haven't done so already, make sure you go on over and subscribe to our full network feed. We don't mind you just subscribing to Twifo, but if you do that, you're missing out on the other dozen or so shows on our network. We got daily news, we got stuff for advisors, we got stuff for volatility traders, stuff for active retail, all of the above. You name it, we got a show aimed at it, so check it out if you haven't done so already. Available on all the major platforms, including wherever you're listening to this. And of course, for those of you 
who are hardcore, who really like your futures, options, news, and info and trading analysis right now in your ear holes this second, we got you covered live via Mixler, M-I-X-L-R, every Friday, 1.30 p.m. Central, 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Grab that link, set it, and forget it. You can find it. We tweet it out. CME puts it out there. So a bunch of you guys see it. You can follow us on Mixler or just grab that link and you'll know when to join us. And of course, if you got that, you can ask us questions, hit us up. A lot of you guys did that this week, so we got a lot of good stuff to talk about. And joining me this week, by the way, before I even mention that, you guys want to follow along with what we talk about here live, not just with the show live, but you can also follow along and make your own reports. This also works after the fact if you're listening to the podcast is, of course, head on over cmegroup.com slash twifo, T-W-I-F-O, while you're listening. And then you can see exactly what the heck Nick and I are actually talking about here when we're looking at the reports live. If you're listening to it after the fact, make sure you adjust that setting to, say, the previous week. Otherwise, it's going to give you up through to the minute wherever you're looking, wherever time. If you're looking at it next Tuesday, for example, it's going to give you through that day. If you want to see what we're talking about today, then set it to the previous week to, so it ends on Friday, and you'll see exactly what we're talking about. And speaking of my cohort, I am joined by my partner in crime, the yin to my yang, the founder of Bantix Technologies and creator of a little platform we've used once or twice or eight million times called Quick Strike. Mr. Nick Howard, he's joining us today on the go from an undisclosed location. Let's see if we can make the handshake work. Mr. Nick, are you there, sir? Yes, testing. Can you hear me? We can hear you, sir, from your bunker there in rural Colorado. Oh, no, I gave away the location, sir. No, no, I'm, uh, I am in uh, rural Indiana, actually a beautiful part of Indiana, not uh, I-65, and hopefully we get to a better cell uh, section pretty soon here, but I think we're in pretty good shape. We probably should talk some ags since I've just driven through miles and miles of corn, but uh, <laughs> got, we'll see if we get to that. You got ags on the brain. Well, you know what our audience has on the brain? Apparently, Mr. Nick... Our audience is a is a split crowd. They can't make up their minds because we had seen me put out a big poll earlier this week asking you guys, what the heck do you guys want us to talk about on the show this week? They gave you four choices, crude oil, a.k.a. our old friend WTI, gold, wheat, so getting in the ag sector there, or nat gas. And this went out through the full CME group. We retweeted, a lot of people retweeted. So tens, nay, hundreds of thousands of people saw this. And guess what they decided at the end of the day, Mr. Nick? Uh, the answer is they decided nothing because they tied. Literal tie, exactly. Can you believe that? Uh, 31% I can't each. Believe it. 31% each for crude oil and for gold. So apparently we got to talk both of those, sir. Even though we probably would have anyway. We're nice guys. Uh, just because uh, we got. Uh, so much love. People can't make up their minds between the both of them. Only 20, 25% for NAS gas. So a distant third there, or second actually with the tie of the first. And then br- wheat bringing up the wheat rear, 13%. I would be remiss if I did not mention the, uh, shall we say, spirited write-in campaign that a lot of people waged for, uh, for Bitcoin. Uh, we had Via, Vianazzo89 saying, Bitcoin, Kelka. Uh, saying Bitcoin, Crypto Chef. I wonder what he likes. Yeah, he likes Bitcoin. Web designer writing in, I want Bitcoin. Dimitri said, I want... Oh, he voted for wheat, actually. He's a write-in for wheat, even though he could have just voted for wheat in the poll, but still love me. Uh, Andrew, a whole bunch of others. Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. So maybe we'll squeeze a little Bitcoin in there at the end. Obviously, uh, some news coming out of CME about that exact thing this week. But Mr. Nick, we got to do what the audience dictates so we got to kick things off up there. Let's just go in order then. That's what they picked. So the top of the list is crude. We shall go there. Our old friend WTI having another interesting week up. A net one handle on the week. So 55 handle, right around 55 and a half, depending on where you're looking out there in the term structure there. But another good week for the crude bulls. They were waiting, hoping, see if it could make that 55 level and then hold it. And indeed it did. So uh, a good week out there for the crude bulls. Of course, a lot of that driven by uh, U.S. production, not doing perhaps as strong as people wanted uh, there in August. You know, if you've been following the crude story for a while and listening to the show, you probably have been. You know, a lot of it is driven by a kind of couple of different polar forces. You got, of course, OPEC, and you got what's going on in the U.S. production. U.S. production has kind of been the story that's been keeping uh, WTI a little bit lower because they found ways to produce it at cheaper levels, and they continue to surprise with more supply and more production in August, not so much. Uh, the production dis- uh, and distillates and other things kind of plummeted. Uh, and so uh, that couldn't really overwhelm the forces 
arrayed against them when it came to OPEC and actually sticking to their cuts this time. So a little bit of higher oil pricing resulting. Uh, you know, I tried to get a boy, Matt, I'm able to get him on again soon because I know he had a nice level. He had predicted a ceiling for crude around the 52 range. Nowhere near as wide as our friends. I think it was City recently who came out and said, oh, you know, <laughs> 35 to 75. Matt was a little bit more surprised. He thought it, t- it would top out around 52, and it stayed there. But it did top out there for quite a while. Finally broke through it recently. Uh, so we'll get him back on to see if he has revised his uh, his his predictions and his ceilings for crude uh, going forward. Also, interesting stuff out there we're seeing in the spreads. Uh, you know, we talk we talk most of the options here, but obviously the futures are a big part of the action as well. That six month, that intermediate calendar spread out there in WTI, uh, typically out there in Katango. So you're seeing the longer term futures get a little bit more juice as they go farther out. It's kind of the natural the natural way that product trades. Swip, swooping into backwardation this week. So the front portion of the curve getting richer than the farther portion. That's the first time it's happened in about three years. Uh, so read into that what you will. Usually when you see that happening, things are getting a little bit more fr- a little bit more chop topsy turvy out there. Expect some action in the near term. And that's pretty much what we saw out here this week in the WTI options as well. Open interest uh, looking pretty strong, up about four and a half percent this week across the board. Of course, we know it's kind of written into the narrative now. Upside and crude means downside when it comes to vol, and that's exactly what we saw. Vol getting just thwacked across the board again, implied vol off. Oh, two plus points, depending on where you're looking out here. Just a really good crushing uh, in a lot of these products. One and a half, a little bit farther out. But still, you know, people keep writing us saying, you know, when's, when's the vol going to turn around? When are we going to get some vol back in this product? And at least for the time being, uh, the answer is uh, we don't know because we see these little blips. Usually when it's related to the downside, vol catches a little bit of a bid, and then it just gets wiped out again, you know, the second that sell-off doesn't last. And so now as we move upside, we know the call is not quite as rich as uh, the puts, so that tends to lean to vol coming off, and people are obviously not reticent to continue crushing vol even at these levels. We'll talk about gold in a little bit, maybe a little bit of an analogous story out there as well. The premium buyers can't catch a break out there. And in terms of what was lighting it up this week from a WTI options perspective, you know, people out there in WTI, we kind of know by now, they like to settle around these, these even strikes. Usually it's a 50 strike when we see, you know, uh, when it's hovering around those levels, we see a lot of action there. This week we're crossing through 55. So surprise, surprise, number one with the bullet was the Dece 2017 55, the double calls, lighting it up to the tune of 46. 1,666 contracts uh, this week. Just a lot lighting it up on that strike. Actually, a little more than tech to trading just coming in, about 47,300 the total there. So number one with a bullet by far out here this week. Uh, pretty active. Actually, the biggest, biggest action coming on Monday, about 13,000 of that 47-odd thousand coming on Monday, about 9,000 on Tuesday, 11,000 on Wednesday, and six and 7,000 yesterday and today. Net closing, actually, on the week, about 6,000 contracts closing. So a lot of back and forth, net closing. Not surprising. This is kind of the new at the money strike. So you're going to see front month at the money is going to be where a lot of churn and burn is going to go on out there. And no surprise, we saw it again this week. Then we fall off quite a bit to our number two, which is the 50 puts. Surprise, surprise. People like these even money strikes out here. Uh, and the risk reversal this week is tightening it up. Usually it might be 45, 55, 45, 50 this week, 50, 55. 50 puts lighting it up to the tune of not quite half. A little more than half here in terms of about 25,000 and change going up this week of the 50 puts. Net closing about nearly 4,000 of that. The lion's share coming on Tuesday, 7,000 of those going up this week. So pretty interesting stuff out there. We also saw, actually I skipped one. I, I buried the lead there. Number two, actually by a slight margin. Were the 57 calls, 57 calls, 27,000 and change those lighting up this week. Again, the lion's share coming on Monday, about 8,200 going up then, about 6,500 going up today, and 6,700 going up on Wednesday. Pretty much unched in terms of closing and or opening out there as well. And that pretty, pretty much the whole strip of the double on up and the 50 puts on up a little bit. We're all pretty active in the front month out there. You kind of pick your poison. Uh, about 48% of the paper this week going up in that Dece front month contract. So crude, as we always said, very front month heavy, continues to be. Uh, it's still a mystery to all of us why it hasn't filtered into the weeklies. Uh, we've heard many different opinions on why that is. Uh, you're free to send us your own thoughts on that. For whatever reason, crude traders like to trade front month and, and no farther. They don't get into the weeklies for whatever reason. Only a couple hundred each of those, or 1,500 of some trading on the front week there. But still, nowhere near what we're seeing in a lot of the monthlies. Go a little bit farther out. 
getting out into Jan of 2018. Saw the 50 puts also active out there, about 19,000 total. Again, the lion's share coming on Monday, about almost 8,000 of that 19,000 coming up. About 8,000, nearly 9,000 openings. So some opening positioning out there in Jan 2018 on the 50 puts out there. Also active out here. We saw a little bit farther, 50 puts out there in uh, March of next year. So 50 strike on the put side, a little bit active in the near term, getting into early 2018, nearly 10,000, about 9,700, lighting it up out there this week. Uh, the lion's share again coming on Monday. Monday, clearly the active day out here for WTI options with about, it's a 9,700, uh, about a third of that going up on Monday, and net about 1,000 closing, actually. So a little bit of closing paper here in early March there of next year. Going a little bit farther out, see if we can see any funky outliers before we toss it over to Mr. Nick out there in the cornfields of Indiana. 35 puts, Mr. Nick, also active out there. Dece of 2018, so going out a year and change. Uh, still some long-term uh, action on the downside there to the tune of about 8,600 out there. Almost all of that coming on Monday, 7,500. The rest kind of scattered bits throughout the week. Uh, about 2,400 of that closing on the week. So uh, net interesting position, a lot of that closing uh, on Monday, but still. So the 35 puts, there is, it's not all upside call action. There still is long-term trading in the far off puts. And if you want really long-term, really far out there, about 1,000 of the par calls traded, Dece 2020. If that's long enough term for you, 900 to be precise going up on Tuesday. Surprise, surprise, all of that opening. So a lot of interesting stuff to parse. Mr. Nick, our audience wanted it. They got it. Well, actually, they, they were tied. They couldn't make up their mind, so they got it anyway. They wanted some crude action. What was catching your eye out there in crude land this week, sir, including what was going on in the quick skew? Well, let's see. Let me just double check it. Am I coming in loud and clear i think i have enough bars out here now yeah, to, uh, we, we got like you I'm we got you it's not quite to... not quite your deep baritones you get in the studio or in the usual your usual office but we can make do okay well i'll try to I'll, i'm gonna i'm gonna loosen my vocal cords to get a little deeper then how about that so we can get a little bit more used to the voice now we're now we're getting the there. Is that better there we go um so it's interesting that you spotted the 35 puts in the Dece of 2018 because I kept my I, I refreshed my browser a little not not immediately ago but just a little bit ago just to make sure I had some on my screen or my iPad and what what's uh, in my most active column out there are the 70 calls uh, for the Dece 2018 so that's good you saw the 35 puts I saw the 70 calls and those were about 9,000 with over um, you know with over six, over 5,500 5,700. Uh, being on the open so so when we have this sort of push up you and i talk about this all the time i you we like to look at the outliers we like to also look um not just the uh um not just at the maxes but also kind of the higher strikes that are trading so we saw the 70s out there in the d's 2018 we see the 60s out there in the in the june 2018 those those uh those traded almost four thousand times but majority of that was closing so so yeah still to reiterate what you said, still the, the majority of the volume taking place out there in the De December contract, but we see some good numbers in the Jan, um, and then you see, uh, you know, they seem taper a little bit, but then you see big numbers again out in the June of 18, 2018 and December of 2018. And if you go out to, if you go out to actually look and see, it's that's pretty typical, and, and and it's actually a little bit more sparse than usual right now because we were just looking at some of the uh, longer dated contracts in the crude. Uh, uh, the last couple of days, and we see that there's even not really the trade is in the June and the Dece of the 2018, and then you don't even really see any June in the 2019. You just see June Dece of 2018, then Dece of 2019, Dece of 2020, Dece of 2021. So um, when we're 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 kind of lopsided to the front side still, and we're not seeing that typical June Dece, June Dece, June Dece. Um, uh, yeah, so. Yeah, it's, it is, and, and I'm glad that I'm glad that I refreshed at one point. Mark did it other because I think we both we both would have missed those 70 calls. So I'm glad it was uh, it worked out that way. But um, you know, there's going to be so we'll throw a little teaser out there, Mark, for when we have our special guests from the CME coming in a couple weeks. There's some really good opportunity to utilize the weekly options coming up here in the next couple of weeks at the OPEC meeting and that type of thing. So we're going to leave that for discussion, but I'm going to throw that teaser out there and let our audience do a little investigation to see if maybe uh, they can figure out what that might be. Um, so if we jump over to the volatility, like you said, Mark, um, up in the futures, not like a not like a bullet up, but more like a whimper, right? More like a, 
a really soft toss. We we're up in the futures, but volatility really got hammered pretty solidly. And, and what's even more interesting is that, you know, typically you see sort of the app, the money straddle hold as we move towards expiration, which is going to do one of two things, which is going to push that front end volatility either to the arch or a little bit up, right? Cause it's trying to keep its value, but we're not seeing that here. We're seeing volatility get hammered pretty solidly, which means that at the money, uh, that at the money premium for that straddle price is going to be lower than it was when we started. So really a pretty good beating for the volatility. And we see that volatility decrease in the January. We see it in the February and we even see three quarters of a point all the way out uh, until June of 2018. And then we see about a half a point out into December. So a pretty good thumping when it comes right uh, down to it. Um, as we had this little, you know, we went through, like you said, with Matt had the 52 and a half. That level was great for weeks and weeks and weeks. We kept talking about it, kept bouncing back off of it. So it will be interesting to hear what he has to say. But now we're back up at this. You know, we did move through the, a couple points in the term structure. So, and it was uh, your typical shape uh, on the futures where it was in uh, uh, contango. So we did kind of move up that uh, price uh, price path. So it makes a little bit of sense, but really a, a pretty solid beat down from a vol standpoint. And then if we jump over to the quick skew, because we like to talk about that on, the, uh, uh, on a weekly basis, we see, again, the puts a little bit big, the calls um, kind of aren't from in terms of uh, where they are from a volatility level for the week. So, um, you know, makes a little bit of sense, I guess, but really as, as much as it's good to see that move higher, it's, it's still that, it's still not much change in terms of what the volatility curve looks like or what the expectation is. And I guess the expectation from what we see here from the shape of the curve is that as we rally, people are going to continue to, to smash fall. And I guess that's another way for us to really look and utilize the quick skew as well, right? Because we talk about moving through the term structure, but in from a, from a, from a, from a day's expiration standpoint, but we could also talk about moving along the volatility curve from a, from a strike standpoint. So, if we continue to move up, I guess the uh, the expectation is that vol will continue to get hit pretty good. And if we go down, vol will get bit a little bit more. So let's pay attention to that a little bit more as we go forward. And I think we kind of all know that inherently, but I think sometimes we tend to only think of the term structure from a vol movement standpoint when we could be thinking about the slide along the volatility curve as well. So um, some some people out there opening some high strike calls. You know, we saw 67s in Feb, 65s in April. Uh, we mentioned the 60s that were closing in June, but we also had the openings in the 70s into December. So, uh, you know, and again, the positive, uh, and, and, I, and I'm not sure if you mentioned, but still open interest up for over 4%, and um, all in all pretty good given where volatility is. Yeah, you know, and it's funny, you know, people can't, people couldn't make up their minds this week between gold and crude. So guess what? You're going to get a heap and helping of both. And like I mentioned, as, as Nick just alluded to, too, it's kind of a not skew wise or anything else, but just from a vol perspective, kind of a bit of a similar story out there in uh, the shiny stuff uh, this week and for recent weeks. I'm just on the show, was it last week or two weeks ago, we were saying how our old favorite, people ask us about our technical signals all, all the time, and uh, one of our favorites, pretty much the only one I, I'll ever look at really, is is uh, the Volcones. It's a great tool for that sort of thing, and gold has been hovering at or near that bottom level of that cone, historic multi-year lows for some time. And so people might be looking at that saying, hey, this is a prime time to buy some premium, and yet can't catch a break, and that continued to be the case this week. Gold settling out pretty much unch, still hovering around that 1270, 1275 range out there this week. Couldn't really break it in either direction. And you know what? <laughs> Sometimes it takes movement to increase or crush vol. This week it didn't take much, and vol still coming in out there in gold land. Pretty heftily, a full point or so across a lot of the near-term contracts out there. So, again, gold doesn't move. And they crush it further. It's interesting. What does it take for a gold ball to catch a little bit of a bid? We'll get into that in a quick skew in a little bit with Nick. But uh, it's going to be probably an aggressive <laughs> aggressive upside move very quickly. That would certainly do it. Uh, downside aggressively would do a little less. It would get a little bit of juice, but nowhere near what we're seeing. Uh, the upside is still where, where the juice tends to be in crude, at least, uh, at least these days. And looking out here to what was lighting it up. Number one with a bullet, actually open interest up, not, not as strong as WTI this week, up, open interest up about nearly 3% uh, 
out here. So good increases, but still not uh, what we're uh, what we've been seeing. And of the paper we saw this week, over half, fifty six, nearly fifty seven percent, coming in the front month. Interesting, similar kind of story here for uh, the big gold options as well. A lot of action in the front month, and not as much in the weeklies here. For whatever re- reason, in these commodities on the futures options side, people seem to be sticking with uh, the primary, you know, the, the serial, the monthly contracts. That seems to be where a lot of their interest and their action is, whereas on the equity side of the space, we've seen so much of the action, almost almost just irrespective of everything else, just flowing into those very, very short-duration contracts. A bit of an interesting contrast here, uh, which is always interesting. And number one with the bullet this week, the 12 half puts. Again, so a little bit out of the money puts leading the charge this week out here in gold. So if you're thinking maybe the gold bugs were going to be back and loading up on some upside, not quite the case. They were close, but not quite number one. 12 half puts, nearly 10,000 contracts going up this week. A pretty evenly split throughout the week. The lion's share actually coming today, nearly 3,000. The rest pretty close to 2,000 across the board for the better part of the week. About 1,200 of those contracts opening on the week. So a lot of back and forth on these 12 half puts. Number two. The gold bugs were lurking in second place this week. 1,300 calls, the even car calls there, doing about 7,000 contracts and change this week. Again, pretty evenly split throughout the week with uh, the lion's share coming a little over 2,000 on Monday, about pretty much unched from an OI perspective. So a lot of churning and burning on the 1,300 strike this week as well. Then we uh, drop off a little bit. Actually, we've got to go a little bit farther out to find our number three. It was a lot of front month, but it wasn't all front month. It was actually out here this month, uh, this week, I should say, as well, out here in March for the March 2018. 13 half calls lighting it up to the tune of about 5,800. Almost all of that coming today, actually. Someone got really excited about Trading some, uh, trading some 13 half calls. Obviously, we don't know OI on those because those went up today. Uh, about 4,700 of that uh, going up today, about 1,000 on Monday. Of the Monday lot, about 100 of that was closing, so uh, kind of net unched uh, OI. Earlier in the week, today's action, uh, we don't know. But someone getting pretty active in those March 13 halves today, uh, which is interesting. Then we go back all the way. Back in there to the front month, to the Dece once again to talk about some uh, 1260 calls. A little bit closer to home, actually. Uh, 1260 puts, excuse me. Uh, a little bit closer to home there. Not quite at the money, but pretty close. Uh, about 5,000 almost even going up this week. Again, a little over half coming on Monday, 2,700 uh, on Monday. Pretty much unched from an OI perspective this week as well. So interesting, kind of a trend of... A lot of churn, but not a lot of uh, huge OI changes uh, out here, which is interesting. And as we like to do with a lot of our products, but particularly gold, particularly because we saw that that crazy trade going up uh, a couple weeks ago, we like to look a little bit farther out just to see if there are any funky outliers coming across our screen. About as funky as it gets this week is DEES 2018, the 13 half calls yet again. That seems to be the strike du jour, doing uh, 4,500 of those bad boys today. So who knows? Perhaps we'll have to dig into the block trades a little bit. Maybe there was a bit of a uh, March D spread going up here, Mr. Nick, in the 13 half calls. I find it, my spidey sense is tingling when I see uh, 4,700 of these going up today and also seeing the 4,500 or so going up of the Dees today as well on the same strike a few months apart tend to assume those are related, but we'll have to dig in a little bit. Maybe Mr. Nick can dig that up while we're looking here to see if that is listed in the block trades as indeed a bit of a time spread. If that's the case, March D's 13 half time spread. Let's see if they're buying the D selling the March. Interesting trade. Obviously, you know, those kind of time spreads, if that is indeed the case, you kind of want this, uh, you don't want a lot of action in the near term. You're short a lot of gamma there. Then as you gets closer to the longer term portion, you want this thing to really kick into high gear. So an uh, interesting uh, play perhaps on some of the term structure out there in the futures. As you mentioned, they got a little backward. So maybe he's taking advantage of selling that nearer portion of the curve because it's a little richer than it tends to be usually and look like the, like to trade that way. A lot of ways to play term structure with those calendars and getting all the way out there 
the crazy, I guess you can call this our craziest uh, for gold here, just because of strike size, not strike, strike wise, not in terms of size wise. 250 of the 1,800 calls went up on Thursday, all opening. So that's our craziest one here in gold this week, Mr. Nick. Uh, what caught your eye out here in the shiny stuff this week? And also, if you had a chance, if you have any more insight, was that indeed a, uh, a calendar spread going up this week, or is that just very coincidental paper on both of those uh, months of strikes? Well, um, I'm looking here at the 1350 strike, and I am seeing in the March it's part of um, what looks like a very – I'm seeing a – one by three. Here's what, let me see. It looks like people were buying the 1200, 1350 call spread and selling the Dece 1145, 1350 call spread. That's what I'm seeing here. And then also, I see a, um, yeah, it's kind of weird. It, it, there's some interesting, uh, separation let's see 4500 4500 so it looks like it's a march dece call spread spread but it looks like it's a one by three in the march and then a ratio and then a, another one by three in the uh that's that's what it is a one by three in the march and a one by three in the dece so um buying buying the the 1200 selling the 1350 in the march and then buying the 1350 in dece and selling the 1200 in, or selling the 11.45 in these. So, so yeah, you you are your senses are right. I wouldn't have seen it as a one by three spread. No, that, 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 that's, that's, that that's that surprising to me. It. Yeah, that's interesting. Right, but but that's what it looks like. And again, uh, just so, so everybody knows, that Black Trade browser is going to be out on the CME site very soon. We've been talking about there, there's going to be a product toolbox out there, and then also a Black Trade browser, which will let you do all this stuff, and it's going to uh, be available, I would say, before the end of the month. We're just kind of uh, uh, finalizing uh, the text for the pages and stuff like that. The tools are actually working and, and pretty solid. It's just a matter of making sure that people can understand how to use them and, and that kind of thing. So those will be available very shortly. So that is uh, a good catch there. As far as other stuff going on, um, you know, uh, same thing. We Our front month is a little different than our 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 crude front month that had 12 days. This has 24 days in the gold, and, and it is the majority of the open interest. But if you uh, with 440, but I'm sorry, for, of the open interest in as well as the as well as the volume. Um, but uh, from an open interest standpoint, you see that front month, and then you see the December of 2018 is the next highest open interest, which is a little bit of an oddball when you see that a year apart being the, the two high open interest uh, expirations. And, and uh, that is a close second to the December of 2018. But I don't think I've ever noticed that before. So it seems to, uh, again, some stuff that we just have to pay attention to a little bit more, sort of these these calendar buffeting expirations to see if there's uh, some reason behind this. And it might be year-end and positioning and stuff like that, but but something to keep, keep an eye on as well. Um, as you mentioned, uh Volatility down again, uh, a full point in the front, and then almost a uh, half a point across uh, the term structure out almost till October. So uh, a continued continued slide in the volatility. And I want to, Mark, I want to talk about one thing I saw as a headline in relation to both the, the crude and the gold ball. So just let's put that as a little reminder point for us to, to have a quick uh, a quick com comment about that. But uh, as far as you know the quick skew and what we talk about every week. There's not much, uh, not much unch there. Calls are still firm uh, to the at the money, and puts are still slightly offered to the at the money. But again, when we're talking these low volatility levels, for all intents and purposes, I'm looking at the 25 delta puts being almost about the same expiration. Uh, I'm sorry, the same volatility as the at the money. So we're seeing uh, a little bit like. Uh, a Nike swoosh curve or however you want to look at it, kind of flat and then a little bit of a whoosh up that's on the call side. So nothing too fabulously um, exciting in terms of changes for the week. Um, but again, you know, we talk, what's it going to take? You know, we are at the down, we are at the low end of, of kind of a pretty typical range that we've had over the last extended period of time with these gold futures prices. So um, I think that, uh, 
I think that we're going to continue to see this range. I mean, we've we've been as high as thirteen fifty, thirteen sixty, not too long ago, and now we're down to twelve sixty eight in the front. Now, you could call that what you want. You could say that. You could say, yeah, there's low volatility in that, but as far as I'm concerned, that's a hundred point move. So there's obviously some trading opportunity in those ranges that we've seen in this contract in particular. So for for everybody complaining about the low vol, yeah, it might be a low vol from a yeah, I just want to sell it, sell it, sell it. But there are definitely low vol gamma plays available here. So I don't know if you necessarily agree with that, but let me know what you think about that because there was just a um, a new service. Uh, email that I just got talked about how Goldman is exiting the market making in the commodities. I think uh, at least the minimum in the commodities because yeah. of the low volatility environment. They're exiting pretty much revenue. pretty much so, across the board. Yeah, I mean that that's kind of a, a sad commentary, you know, on on our times. Uh, we didn't get to it on our last show, but you know that headline just kind of coming out this week. Uh, of course, the Goldman market making division is the, formerly the Hull division that they pretty much bought and turned into when a lot of the big banks discovered. Uh, the gold, literally, and then there are hills out there in options market making back in the late 90s, early 2000s that came in and started buying up the market making firms that were out here in Chicago. Hull went to Goldman for a substantial amount. You know, that just shows how much value there was in market making back then versus now. I think it was half a billion more that they bought it for, and now they're shutting down the remnants of it uh, kind of uh, inauspiciously. So a bit of a sad thing. I think they obviously have expanded other products. You mentioned the commodities. They trade those out there as well. Uh, but, yeah, kind of a, uh, a bit of a sad uh, – and, right, and they kind of pin the blame on low vol. Everyone's got some blame for something. Oh, it's low vol that hasn't driven a lot of action in a lot of their core products like individual equity options and things like that. But, yeah, this, you can make that same claim about a lot of futures options these days too, including crude and including gold because there's no vol to be found out there as well. So I don't know. Do you, are you buying that or you, th- you think, I, as I think, that it's more of a uh, kind of a market structure and issue with liquidity providers than it's like, you know, they're trying to blame it on low vol. Are you buying that story, Mr. Nick? Well, I, I think the part that struck me as funny in that, you know, I think if, you, if you're really fine – uh, draw the fine line uh, on, on the definition of market making, right? You would you would think from a market making standpoint, at least when we were there, you know, we would make markets, we would get hit on the bid or get lifted on our offer, we would hedge, and then we would manage our position. Occasionally, we would do stuff that we liked based on where the futures were or what the ball looked like. So, if you're looking at it purely from a market making and, and a low volatility, yeah. So there's not a lot of bid ask play going on. There's more positioning play. But I think, yeah, I, I'm going to say I'm going to call a little bit of a cop out on it because, you know, a place like Goldman, you would think that they'd look at, you know, we talk about pretty simple stuff in terms of, hey, there's a range here. You could trade the range. There's spreads you can do that take advantage of the range, no matter what the volatility is. You can get short of strangle if you think you're going to stay between 1250 and 1400, right? It really doesn't matter what the vol. In, in, maybe the vol might hurt you if there's a little bit of a run up, but if we stay in that range, it's still a trade. So. Yeah, from a pure market making, I can trade the both sides of the bid ask to make some edge. I guess they have an argument, but at the same time, they're golden. They're, they're those, those are supposed to be the smartest guys in the street. You mean to tell me you can't find stuff to trade per se? So you make your markets, you still do that, but you know I, I can't imagine that their spec stuff is stopped, right? So, you know, I, I think a lot of those guys maybe turn to just putting positions on and managing them. So, so yeah, I think I think uh, I get it. You know, volatility breeds trade, right? Back and forth. I make money on the on the on the spread, but you know, I, I'm not I'm not I'm not buying that there's not opportunities in these markets because we talk about them all the time. Yeah, you know, they they clearly say they're going to keep up their you know their more quote unquote I guess you can call it speculative, but their actual you know trading or whatever what's allowed by Volcker these days. You know, their other activities in derivatives, just the market making side. Uh, is uh, is going the way of the dodo. And again, that is kind of the legacy of a lot of the Chicago firms here like Hull. So it's kind of sad to see uh, those things kind of going the way of the dodo. But again, that's a reflection of the time. Everyone who writes in, including this show all the time, with all these conspiracy story, stories about these cabals of evil market makers manipulating the markets. Yeah, if, they were, if that was the case, if they were making all this money, they would not be exiting the business left, right, and center. So uh, yeah, at the end of the day, economics trumps even the, the grandest of conspiracy theories. Mr. Nick, you said you're uh, floating around the ag land. You want to hit an ag before we roll on into some of the questions and the hot movers of the week and stuff? We had, we had wheat on the poll. It came in third. You want to do a little, uh, little, little wheat? Yeah, let's take a look at it. I don't, I'm, I'm 
see if I can pull it up. Let's see what you got, and then right. we'll. Uh, I will lead you to we'll, the dark we'll side, and you could follow me down the path. We'll, we'll not. We won't talk Kansas City. We'll talk the old SRW uh, wheat out here instead. That seems to be where the lion's share of the action was. Wheat actually has been coming up on our kind of market movers, kind of gainers and losers out here for the last couple of weeks. It has been moving uh, this week, not so much. The week we spent, we picked to talk about it, only off about a third of a percent or so out there, hovering around about four twenty six uh, in their front portions there, a little bit, a little bit obviously higher up in the longer term portions out there uh crew actually crude uh, wheat vol actually ticking up a bit this week so i guess if you're looking for a spot to buy some premium maybe uh crude or <laughs> wheat was the place i got crude in the brain this week listeners i got wheat was the place to do it this week with vol up pretty strong across the board out here open interest also up pretty strong nearly 10 percent. so big uh Big OI and vol week out here in uh, in wheat, even if the net move on the week was not huge. Intraweek, obviously, they had some action going on. And going on here, looking at here what the number one with the bullet strike was. And we know these ags trade to send on, tra- tend to trade on a more seasonal type calendar with the planting, the new crop, old crop stuff. So they tend to trade on a little bit different rules of engagement. That said here, the wheat coming in, uh, Dees 2017, 440 calls lighting it up this week. Number one. With a bullet, nearly 10,000 of those lighting it up this week. About a third of that coming today, uh, and about nearly half coming on Tuesday. About 4,600 going up on Tuesday. Net unched from an OI perspective on the week, so a lot of rocking and rolling kind of on this strike all week long. And number two right behind it, 9,000 and change of the 420 puts. So a pretty tight strangle slash risk reversal there. The 440, 420 strangle risk reversal kind of right around that 425 strike, which is the at the money there. About 9,000 and change. The lion's share coming on Thursday, actually. Nearly 3,000. It's about a third going up on Thursday. The rest almost close to it. Almost another 3,000 on Tuesday. The rest kind of scattered uh, throughout the week. About 2,000 net closing out here on the week we also saw interest in the 430 call so not surprising those are pretty much at the money about 6500 of those going up this week about a 2500 on tuesday that was the most active day about 1200 of those opening throughout the week kind of a nice little strip around the uh, actually actually it's gone a little bit farther too because number four is actually not in the front month again speaking to the cycle of how these things trade is actually out here in March 2018. It's the 430 puts trading about 6,100 contracts, almost all of that, about 6,000 coming up on Tuesday. So a big day out there on Tuesday for these 430 puts in March 2018. Lion's share of that opening, actually, about 4,300 of that opening. So some opening positioning out here for size in these 430 puts in March uh, maybe you wheat guys out there, if you could tell us if that's uh, if that's an outlier or more par for the course. Speaking of outliers, let's dig a little bit farther to see if we can get a little bit a little bit crazier here on the curve. If we go out here to uh, these are actually look like uh, these are what are these? These are these are coming up week eight actually, so they're far out there. Uh, these are the five hundred calls, and uh, actually no, I'm sorry, these were. These are May. These are the May 500 calls uh, with uh, about 1,800, nearly 2,000 going up uh, this week. So a little bit out there, uh, about 1,200 on Monday, 600 on Tuesday, About only about 500 that opening. So a little bit of back and forth even there as well. If we go a little bit farther out, what do we got? 500 calls also active in Dees 2018 about oh nearly about uh, about four or five hundred going up out there this week so interesting stuff across the board mr nick maybe the vol story has been in wheat maybe that's where you should be buying your vol out there what, what caught your eye out here as you were driving through the fields in indiana uh and from a quick skew perspective out there in wheat sir well uh first thing i make mention i, I get uh, i get an email from uh one of the brokers in uh in uh, the pit that uh, on the corn pit, and uh, he mentioned you. You had said how there was. You said about the 440 called 9,000 traded right in the December uh, contract, and uh, the the comment that he made was how uh, one brokerage house was able to get 6,000 options all at around uh, the same price within a quarter uh, within a quarter of a tick. So I thought that was kind of interesting because when you think of it. Like when we talk in gold, when we talk in crude, or we talk in S and P's, or we talk in the Treasuries or the Euro dollars, six thousand lot might be part of us. You know, one guy taking. We hear talk about the liquidity in in, in the in the ag products and how it's a, um, 
how six thousand within a quarter of a or quarter of a quarter of a twenty five cents a quarter of a tick thing. Um, I just found that kind of you know it's it's all about perspective in terms of these different markets. So uh, given that that much trades, you could have an effect in the volatility on a nine thousand lot, right? Depending on how these four forty calls trade, if they're outright or part of a spread. So that's uh, again that's something that if if anybody has any more insight to it, that's always a welcome. Uh, as far as we're concerned, um, as far as the quick skew, you know, any no, no, you know, I, week over week, I try to look for a significant, uh, significant changes in terms of you know the tilt and the curve. So not seeing a tremendous amount of change, but we will mention that these contract has 21 days uh, to expiration, and the puts were were uh, uh, much cheaper last week. You know, they uh, they went from a three percent cheap to a one and a half percent cheap, but the calls were. Five percent rich to uh, um, to six uh, percent rich, so we had a little bit of a change there. Uh, you know, a little bit of an overall bid on the curve. You know, just a little bit of a tightening, like you take your shoestrings and you pull them up a little bit. So we had the curve jump up a little bit in terms of uh, uh, the volatility on the on the wings there. But other than that, um, the next most interesting, well, maybe even more interesting, uh, the Jan puts are much less offered than they were, but that's probably a function of the fact that the a majority of the open interest uh, just started to occur this week. So you see that a lot as well. When there's an initial trade and an expiration, you'll see the curve be really kind of tilted one way or another because there's a bias to calls or a bias to puts right away in terms of that new contract coming on the board that Jan just came on the board. So that probably could wash that one out. But other, um, other months don't see much change at all. I see a pretty consistent uh, uh, shape of the ball curve over – uh, the course of the week, and, and then, um, you know, that's about it. This, like you said, there was some bid here across the board, and I don't think that there was a, a great deal of activity from a from a futures range standpoint. Let's see if this comes up. So, I mean, we pretty traded pretty steady today, but a little bit of a break near the end of the day, and then for the week. Uh, we had a we had a break, you know. We were we we're pretty much almost at punch for the week, but we but we did break down to four, from 428 down to uh, traded below almost almost to 416. The low being uh, 416 and a quarter. So our ball could have come from there, and then we rallied back up. So you know this market trades a little bit different, I think, than the crude and the gold, where you know these these ranges I don't think are as established as the ones that we've seen over on the other two. So. This actual movement within the week is going to probably lend itself well to having some volatility in the market. But you know, I think still overall we're looking at some low points here, uh, maybe a little bit of bounce week for week. But uh, that's all we got. I mostly saw corn, and I'm not really great about uh, differentiating between. I know the corn because you can everybody kind of knows what corn looks like, but the flatter crops, like I don't know what's beans. I don't, you know. So I need to learn a little bit more about that. Maybe we should have a graphic that shows us what these what these different commodities look like in their life cycle. From, <laughs> there you um, go. Some you commodity know. graphs. While we educate Mr. Nick on all things corn, let's break down what were the big movers, the winners and looners, losers out here uh, from all the products that are trading it up this week from the entire universe over there on the CME Group. It's a pretty broad universe. Uh, number one with a bullet this week, I'll give you a hint at moos. <laughs> Talking live cattle. This week up five, nearly five and a half percent. So leading the charge up there this week. Maybe that could be our surprise product of the week. Certainly surprises us whenever we talk about it. Once in a while, you guys write in for some of the uh, livestock type stuff. Maybe we'll, we'll feature one of those on the show again soon, just for just for fun, because they are interesting products, shall we say? Number two, our Bob, the gas up about nearly four and a half percent. Palladium, number three, three point eight eight percent. Then more cattle, feeder cattle, three point seven two percent. Hitting the top five, all right, on the, right number five there is actually our old friend WTI, three point three two percent on the week. And as for the downside, the dark side, the losers, uh, rough rice off about two and a half percent this week, followed by lumber off one point three seven percent. And soybean oil off about 1.3%, and then Oats off a clear 1%, and the E-mini Russell taking it on the number five spot on the downside, about 0.82% off on the downside. Now we're talking, all the guys are looking for looking for volatility. Everyone's lamenting S&P volatility isn't really there. We've been talking on some of our shows, Russell Vol, kind of lingering in there a little bit. So if you're looking for a place for some action, maybe Russell is the place to look, at least from a Vol perspective. Meanwhile, speaking of looking for stuff, don't look far for your questions. we got a bunch of them, so let's keep on rolling into 
the Futures Options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for Futures Options Feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at the options You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app. Available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live every Friday at 3 p.m. Central via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Futures Options Feedback. This is the portion of the show where we're surprise, surprise, you give us your feedback. You tell us what's on your mind, your thoughts. You guys have many and varied thoughts on a wide variety of products this week. I mentioned at the top of the show, a lot of people checking out that uh, poll senior put up for asking what you guys want to talk about on the show this week. And uh, far and away, the write-in winner, if there was no slot for it to vote. If it was a voting slot, maybe, who knows, maybe it would have won. Maybe for next week, we got to put that in, even though it's, it's not really a product we can get a lot of data on yet, it is, of course, Bitcoin. Everyone and their mother was writing in Bitcoin. They wanted us to talk about it, wanted us to talk about it. Uh, so, and this is for whatever reason, Twifo has become the de facto Bitcoin slash crypto show here on the network. And it makes even more sense this week because our friends over there at CME announcing they're getting into the crypto fray too, which kind of surprised me because I've been talking to them for a while saying, hey, you're going to get into the fray, you're going to get into the fray. We obviously knew SIBO listing cash settled uh, futures, hopefully once they get approval sometime by before the end of this year. And it didn't seem like CME was going to get into that fray. Then all of a sudden this week, they announced that they were doing it with their own futures coming on the Bitcoin. I believe it's on their Bitcoin reference index that you could find on the website. I'm hoping they get someone over there for that product, maybe on the show. It's not quite options related. It's a future, but it's such an interesting topic. I don't think you guys will mind. That said, we thought we'd follow up with all this just crypto furor, Bitcoin love out there. We said, you know, there's no there's no real listed derivatives yet. Hopefully by the end of the year, uh, these products will be live. We could see the futures at least. So let's just play a little pretend game. And say, hi, you know, there's futures and indeed there's options on these futures. Uh, so with Bitcoin blowing past the 100 billion market market cap, what would you guys do right now if the options were available to you? We gave you four choices. We said you could buy calls or call spreads. You could buy puts or put spreads. You could sell covered calls for those of you looking for a nice little maybe liquidity, a little bit of exit. Or just saying, you know, I, I, I'm out. I hate crypto. Uh, I'm not going to touch this. Mr. Nick. I'm guessing you didn't cheat, but we'll shall see. we shall see. Uh, what would your vote be? And then all, more importantly, what do you think is dominating our poll, sir? Well, um, I, I, personally, um, I personally would do covered calls myself because I feel like uh, it gets you the best of both worlds um, because uh, you, uh, you, you, you pretty much are going to make some money on that. You're going to get stopped out, but at least you're going to get your premium. So I think, or you got a chance at least you're not going to necessarily make money, but you got a chance there. But I'm guessing that most people said going to buy calls just because of the nature of the fact that we haven't seen a, a, a really significant drop in the product as of yet. And, and, and I'll go back to, um, uh, to the old irrational exuberance comment. I, uh, by a former Fed chair. Yeah, if anything qualifies as potentially irrational exuberance, it could be the uh, the Bitcoin crypto affair. You are correct, sir. You know your crypto sentiment. Overwhelming majority, 52%, saying they want to buy calls or call spreads out there in Bitcoin. Kind of hard to fault them. This thing just sets new records pretty much weekly out here. So, uh, yeah, it's got, it's, got, it's got the old school, let's say, Apple back in the heyday of Apple three or four years ago. And they're pushing 700, but maybe 211. <laughs> this is, people are just obsessed with this thing. Uh, only 19% want to buy puts or put spreads. 16% saying they're done, they hate crypto. And 13% only saying selling covered calls. I'm with you. I thought the covered calls, that kind of excited me. I thought that would be one of the more interesting ones because you hear a lot of complaints about be, having a hard time finding an exit, getting be able to get some liquidity in these things in terms of selling the Bitcoin. And one of the reasons it continues to run up. So I think a covered call would be attractive. B, that skew would be out of control. So you'd get a huge 
you could sell these things with crazy premiums. So, so yeah, if you wanted an exit and to get paid pretty well to do it, you'd miss some upside, obviously, because it thinks that's new records every week. But uh, that said, I don't think the covered call might be an attractive one, but only 13% getting, uh, getting some love out there uh, for that. Since we're talking Bitcoin really quickie, quickly, um, I don't know, Nick, maybe you have some data on this. You have some data. I know you're looking. Hopefully when we have the futures, we'll have better data. Man Talk asking, what is the actual implied volatility of Bitcoin? Uh, I guess that depends. There's a million different quote-unquote exchanges and venues out there listing these things in some capacity. So I guess it depends where you're looking. I don't know if there's any one that really aggregates it. Maybe that's what the CME one attempts to do. I don't know. You got any insight into this, Mr. Nick, as the keeper of all of our data here? I, I think I'm going to go try to find um, something I sent because we did do a study on it. And we do have a lot of data from Terra Exchange, which we're going to be making available shortly um, within uh, the application. And then we'll also uh, obviously be covering whatever uh, is available within, um, within the, the CME. But I believe that the at the money was like in the 60 to 70 volatility range uh from what i call and what i'll what, when i get back to my desk what i'll do is i'll um i'll push out that and i think we looked at three months worth of data and uh, and i believe i said uh, previously that it was let's let's call it 70 percent vol and i think the, it had a pretty from a distribution standpoint and the implied vol, you know calculating the applied volatilities out to create a volatility curve it looked like the 25 deltas were around 110 percent on the downside and a similar volatility on the upside but i believe the hats were somewhere in the 60 to 70 range but we'll have more data like i said we're going to be doing some work with Terra exchange because they have a, they have a, a bitcoin usd and a bitcoin eur and obviously anything that the cme has we'll be doing uh going forward so we'll probably have some good historicals from Terra in terms of uh uh, the uh, underlying uh, uh, index price because they are CFTC approved uh, index, and uh, so that will be good for us to be able to do some predict predicting from a volatility standpoint. And then we're gonna, uh, for all the products or any of the Bitcoin, will be having the ability to kind of build your own ball curve and start to get some premium prices there as well. So uh, one, one thing I did want to say though, you know, there's obviously got to be market makers out there. They're gonna fuel all the purchasing of these calls from the uh, from from our voters, our calls and call spreads. But inherently, what these market makers that are selling calls, they're going to have to buy the underlying, right, to, to hedge themselves. So they'll be doing coverage themselves. But, you know, it may be this self-fulfilling fuel uh, that, that drives this market up, right? Because I'm buying calls, I'm selling them, I got to hedge them, I got to buy the underlying. So it's, uh, it's going to be interesting. Or they could sell puts. These guys selling the calls could sell the puts. Right, because they got to get long deltas as well. So maybe that's some of that's going to be happening. So if there's no put buyers, only call buyers, the market makers. And see, but see, I, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that trades. Uh, I, I, it's really going to be interesting because I can't. I, I just don't know if there, there's just. I don't know what kind of size you could put on those markets. And like you said, the ball's going to be crazy big. So that's why I tend to think that you know it might not be as as not so as people think. It might get a little bit more. Um, a little bit more normalized or stable in terms of what the ball could look like. But I guess we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, I'm actually surprised. 60 to 70 actually sounds a little bit more reasonable. I thought it might be a lot higher, just given the fact that we've seen some great... I guess it depends, obviously, on the frame of reference and the venue you're looking at and stuff. But 60 to 70, that's, uh, that's, that's, you know, that's actually comparatively reasonable for a product that's as crazy as that one is of late. Uh, let's see, another one here from Nilsec asking us, uh, I know people use straddles, I'm assuming he means straddles, it says strads, uh, to predict earnings, movements, and stocks. Does the same analysis work for crop reports and other commodity stuff? Uh, yeah, all that stuff, yes. Yes, it does work. At the end of the day, it's all event risk. You're looking at what the straddle, so what the actual event is, is almost immaterial. It could be an earnings event, could be a crop report, could be a surprise announcement, it could be whatever. You know, uh, it could be whatever, as long as there's an event and you're using the straddle to analyze it, that's kind of what you're doing. And so, yeah, if there's a vet risk, crop report, whatever, FDA, you know, approval for a biotech name, whatever the case may be, uh, that will all be priced into the straddle. So, yeah, that analysis still holds true, and it's fairly simple. And, again, at the end of the day, we said this before, people talk, particularly with earnings, whisper numbers, or with crop reports, some sort of, you know, insight in information into that. But the straddle is always going to be your best predictor because it's real money. 
uh, at work there in the space. So yes, you can use that analysis uh, for both. All right, we got time. Let's see. It's time for one more. Uh, here's a weird one. It came from, I guess, Tiny Spec, Mr. Nick. He wants us, can you discuss the CME announcement that they are allowing block trades and pre-execution communications uh, in all uh, CME things? I don't, I don't know what he's talking about, but he's asking, uh, can there, is there, is, he's effectively asking for block trades. Can you, can you, is there pre-communication allowed, pre-execution communication? I don't know how you could do a block without setting it up. That's kind of inherent in the block trade, you know, uh, ecosystem. You have to go out there and shop the order in order to find the answer. Now, the downside of that, of course, is there's information leakage. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure what the specific announcement is, uh, so we can't really speak to that. But uh, just the notion, I mean, I, I don't know, Mr. Nick, maybe you're more familiar with it, how you could even execute a block trade without somehow, you know, facilitating it and shopping it first. It's kind of part, part and parcel of the trade, is it not, sir? Yeah, so I think what they're referring to is, uh, I believe yesterday the CME announced that the ad complex will now be afforded the opportunity to execute block trades. So that is the reference uh, uh, for him and, or her. And then the second part is when you do a block, yes, there there is a there is a prearranged con there is obviously a conversation, right? Because you're looking to do something, but you have to announce that conversation on the wire to let people, you're saying, I'm going to do, say you're going to do covered. I'm going to do this versus this. And you have to announce it. And what that does is it does afford people who are paying attention to that part of the market to participate in that spread. So it's not going to automatically be hidden or given to one individual person. There's going to be some opportunity for some participation to people outside that initial conversation. And secondly, which people may not necessarily know that are listening is that, um, CME Direct is now the platform to uh, to uh, execute uh, block trades. So now everything has to go through uh, the CME Direct platform. So if you're not on that, you know you can you can go on there and, and actually see the block trades coming through through the CME's version of the block trade browser, uh, through our version, which is embedded as part of the CME Direct platform, and then also. If you'll you'll see block trade RFQs, I believe, in there, so you'll be able to participate if that's something uh, that you are, are looking to do. But that's uh, that's the announcement, and I just happened to um, I just happened to see that come through, and then I talked to uh, my ag buddy over there. I guess Tim and Driesen did the announcing. I talked to Steve Stacy over there, and he he gave me a little bit of insight about that. But that's what's coming. I'm not exactly. A, I don't know if it's already done or if it's coming or whatever. But that is a big deal because. You'll, it's currently not available, and I think it's going to make a difference for people. Yeah, I, I, I can't imagine how they put those up before. <laughs> That's kind of just a requirement to really get a lot of that paper up, is uh, to be able to facilitate it or at least shop it. You can, I mean, try to go out to any product. I don't care what it is and say, I want to buy 5,000 of X, and then try to do it just hit lifting an offer. It, it's not going to work. Uh, so you got to at least, you know, have a good broker usually who can facilitate that for you, find maybe a counterparty for some or all of that, and or at the very least, you know, prep the market, get you a good price you can get all of it done at, and that requires a little bit of pre-execution communication. <laughs> you just throw your orders to the winds, uh, that's especially the size ones like that, that could be a little bit dangerous. So, all right, good questions. Unfortunately, that music means we got to leave it there. Keep those questions coming. Uh, we'll get to a bunch of them on next week as well. And we, we read them all, even if you don't answer them all on the show. We'll try to get to you in your week if you hit us up there as well. And, of course, uh, before we wrap up here, head on over to cbgroup.com slash twifo. Great way to try out the tools here we're talking about, regenerate your own reports. And then if you like it, you can upgrade to the full kit and caboodle over there at Quick Strike because they got a lot of cool stuff over there, including the block trades and everything else. Mr. Nick, tell them what they can get if they upgrade and where they could go to do just that. Well, there's a lot you can do to upgrade, and you know, I usually don't, I usually don't push the upgrade. But I've been reading this book called Four by an NYU professor, and it talks about Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and um, and uh, gosh, why do I always forget Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and what's the other big one? Uh, well, Google. Gosh, that's so pathetic. Google. And, anyway, 
Um, there's four big companies. Well, Google, yeah. Well, how can I forget Google? Right? I got to do it alphabetically. A A F G. Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. And in and, and one of the things you talked about is, is promoting. You know, when you're starting a product, you got to promote the product. And I promote it. I promote the free stuff. But you know what? I'm going to promote the subscription today because there is a lot of great stuff that's available outside of the free stuff, which whether it be you know increased frequency of volatility updates, you're actually getting volatility updates through the day getting a chance to look at the block trade browser inherently and seeing how those things relate to the volatility that's in the market as well. And, uh, you know, you got to keep, and, and, and for people that aren't trading on CME Direct, you should trade on CME Direct, if not for the sole reason that you get a really, really good comprehensive version of QuickStrike integrated as part of that tool. So uh, that's something you should definitely do. And the one other thing I wanted to mention is I think, I think that the Bitcoin is going to be under the equity uh, umbrella over at CME uh, as part of uh, as part of that. So I was I was curious. I think that's what I heard. So I was curious where it was going to show up, and and that's where it is. So, uh, but go we'll take a look. CMEgroup.com slash quickstrike no C, or bantix.com b a n t i x dot com, or uh, shoot me an email uh, on the info or the support if you have any specific questions. But take a look because I will say this too, and this is uh, and I'll, uh, as long as we're talking about the. While there are lower monthlies available in QuickStrike, you should take a look and see if you're interested because come the end of the year, we're going to have one professional version and that's it. And, uh, and because we feel like uh, uh, that's where most of our users are and that's what we're going to cater to going forward. So there's obviously going to be the free stuff that's still available, but the upgrade is going to take you right to the professional level. So thanks for the kick in the pants, Mark. That's all I got to say right now. <laughs> there you go. Get in while the getting's good, listeners. You can check it out a bunch of different places, QuickStrike. You can search for that, Q-U-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E. Remember, there's no C in there. Leave out the C for cool. Uh, or go to Bantix, B-A-N-T-I-X.com. It's all there as well. The Quick Strike, the Quick Vol, all the other cool stuff. And if you're listening to this show, you like this stuff, check it out. Kick the tires and light the fires because this is literally the only game in town when it comes to futures, options, analytics. I don't really know how you can trade these products actively and not have access to this kind of stuff. So head on out there and check it out and uh, support our friends over there at QuickStrike because they create a lot of great stuff for you guys to use on a regular basis. Bantix, B-A-N-T-I-X dot com to learn more. Get in there before the end of the year. They start changing all the prices up. Get the good deals now. Go for it. All right, on behalf of Mr. Nick and our friends over there at CME and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading, streaming, and subscribing to the show. And of course, for sending in so many great questions, not just about Bitcoin, send a lot of those too, but about all their good stuff. Keep them coming. We love them all. We'll see you next week for more of This Week in Futures Options. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by QuickStrike, options pricing and analysis software. QuickStrike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy-to-use web-based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page-level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. QuickStrike has you covered with market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility. QuickStrike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about QuickStrike at Bantix.com. That's B-A-N-T-I-X.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at QuickStrike1. That's Q-U-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E-1. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. The 
preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.